Well, let's go. Um, somebody asked about the projects. We'll get started on those the first day after the exam, and we'll get going and have some deadlines. You're not behind if you haven't done anything. I'm a day or so behind myself, but we'll, we'll make up for that. So we'll get going on that right away. Okay, today and the test and all that. Um, so the first bit of good news is nothing I talk about today will be on the exam. I'd initially planned to add some new material today, and I realized over the weekend, what am I thinking? It's on Thursday, people are confused, they're not going to have time to, you know, ask questions. And so, right before class, I put a line through Cochrane Orcut, and I put a line through Arch Models. I may end up covering those today, but they're not on the exam. So the review now has lines through two things, which you are probably the only ones who know about. The people that don't show up, study it, that's, that's their fault. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is the labs just fell in an awful way this year because of the... Normally I would have had this test on Tuesday. We want to have the labs crossing the exam. I got one on Wednesday before the exam, one on Thursday after the exam, and it just messes everything up. Normally I'd have it on Tuesday, but I was going to be on, out of town on Thursday, and so it just... It, it, we had to have the exam then. Anyway, the upshot is I didn't know what to do with the labs. What I'm going to do is turn tomorrow's lab, Wednesday, into essentially an extended two-hour office hour. We're not going to do anything new in there. I'm not going to assign any new homework for next week. So you won't have any new homework due. You can show up Wednesday or Thursday at any one of the four labs to turn your homework in. So if you want to get it done, get it out of the way. If you have it done, and turn it in on Wednesday. If you want to wait till the exam's over and spend all Thursday afternoon getting it done and written up so it doesn't interfere with your studying, that's fine too. The people that are due on Wednesday could push it forward to Thursday. The people on Thursday could turn it in on Wednesday. All of that is fine. So you can turn your homework in at any one of the four labs. And hopefully that'll help some to sort of let you manage your time in the way that's best for you. And it doesn't give anyone an advantage over anyone else in terms of when they have to have their homework done. What I was concerned about was the Thursday people would have an advantage over the Wednesday people because they don't have to do theirs until after the exam. The topics on homework four will be on the test though, right? Yes, okay. yes. And that's the reason why I didn't just delay the due date a week because I wanted to engage with the material. It, you needed to do it to sort of understand it, I thought, but, but it fell in a way that was just not optimal in any sense. And I should have said something about this beforehand, but it just didn't dawn on me. I, I, I've been struggling on how to handle it. And, and it so the, for two hours tomorrow, you can get all the help you want. I'm going to take questions today for as long as you have them. So, you know, we got three hours of office hours ahead of us, essentially. Yes? Yes, yeah, sorry if I missed it, but for the, those notes on Thursday... You can um, turn it in Wednesday if you want. You need to attend the Thursday lab, or is that going to kind of be canceled? No, they'll still be... She'll still show up. But um, she will go over the exam if you want on Thursday. If you want, I, she, she will have the solutions and she'll go over and answer any questions about the exam or anything else. But basically, you can just show up and turn your homework in and split, and you won't miss a dang thing. That's true Wednesday, too. So, again, with it so close to the exam, you know, making you go to a lab the night before an exam when. when you need to be studying, just didn't seem optimal to me. So you can, you can, you know, dine and dance or whatever I'm trying to find there. Just drop it off and, and run away. All right. Oh, and you, you don't have to. Well, anyway, I've said it enough. <laughs> okay, so that's the first thing. Um, so today I was initially going to cover the new material and then proceed to take questions for the rest of the period if it ran out and move on. What I think I'm going to do instead, since it's not on the exam, is just start with questions. Get all your questions out of the way. If it goes the whole time, it goes the whole time. I'm not so upset about that. If not, then I'll go ahead and cover Arch and Cork, Copper and Orca, and that'll be for, for the next exam. Because we can't waste our time. But you know, if you've got questions on the exam, uh, Now's the time to start asking. 
Otherwise, I'll just go on. I got a whole lecture ready just in case, because sometimes people don't have questions. I know at least two people sent me emails, and I said that would be great to ask in the, in the uh, I'm assuming they're not here. Not feeling as bad about the email now. Yes? Um, part of the question one, when it um, has the null hypothesis equal to six, um, is that just like the same thing when it's equal to zero? Or is it going to be the same Yes. Yeah, so the, the no, I, I, I apologize, I do not have my, my homeworks and things with me, so you'll have to help me. But the, the null is something like, like this versus the alternative, say, say beta 2, that beta 2 is not equal to 6, something, something along those lines. Yeah, it's, it's 4 beta 2 minus 2 beta 3 equals 6. Oh, oh okay, gotcha. 4 beta 2 minus 2 beta 3 equals 6. The question is how to do that. Yeah. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Okay, th this is not what I thought. <laughs> All right, this is one of the cases where you have to estimate a restricted and an unrestricted model and then look at the F statistic. And so what you want to do, first of all, let's suppose that the initial model is yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 x2i plus beta 3 x3i plus ui. Is that about what it was? Something like that? Is there four variables there? Let's do all four of them then. No, there's no. There's three. There's three. Okay. Plus ui. Now what we do is just impose this restriction. So let's impose that... Um, and we could do it either way. Does anyone remember? Did I do this in class? Or? No, we didn't. So what you have is that 4 beta 2 equals 6 plus 2 beta 3. Or beta 2 equals 3 halves plus 1 half beta 3. So that's your restriction rewritten. So the first thing to do is take this restriction. The very first step when you have a linear restriction like this is take the restriction or the restrictions, if there's more than one, and solve them for one of the two variables. And it really doesn't matter which one you solve for, you'll get exactly the same answer when all is said and done. So solve for one of them. Then sub that in to here and solve for the restricted model. So yi is beta 1 plus 3 halves plus 1 half beta 3 x 2i plus beta 3 x 3i plus ui. Step 1, solve for one of the betas. If there's, there could be two of these restrictions. If so, just sub each one of them in. But we only have one, okay? So sub it in. The next step is anything with a beta stays on one side and the error, anything without a beta goes to the other side. So let's expand this out. Yi equals beta 1 plus 3 halves x2i. No beta there. That's probably going to the other side. And it is. plus one half beta three x two i plus beta three x three i plus u i. So I just, I just multiplied it out. I haven't done anything fancy at this point. <coughs> now, this has no beta. It's going to go to the other side. And I want to group these two together and isolate the beta three. So now we're just trying to write it in a linear form. In the standard beta 1 plus, there's no beta 2 plus beta 3, where the betas are in front and everything else is, is out on the other side. So I'm going to move this over here. I'll say yi minus 3 halves x2i equals beta 1 plus 3 halves x2i plus beta 
Beta 1 plus beta 3 times x2i over 2 plus x3i plus ui. So then the restriction, no betas on the left hand side, betas on the right, group your terms. Always the same. Those steps will always be the same. All right, now, now let's remember that you've got a spreadsheet somewhere that has all these variables in it. So there's your header. This is column A, column B, column C, column D, one, two. So there's, there's data. This, this one's all ones, and it's usually inside the computer. But implicitly, there's a data set sitting there. To get this variable here, this is y i star equals beta 1 plus beta 3 x i star plus u i. So the first thing you have to do is make your y i star. So you just say, OK, that's this column minus 3 halves of this column gives me this variable. So this would be a minus 3 halves times c. If this is called a, b, c, d, these c's are kind of, oh, uh, d. Oops. <laughs> it was c. And this is called a, column b, column C, D, and so on. So this would be like A11 minus 3 halves times C11. Would be that variable. Does that make sense? So that's Y star. And then what would X star be? It'll just be C11 over 2, right? You have to write a little bit different when you do it in the spreadsheet. Plus D11. Here. Or I guess it's just D1 in the stupid spreadsheet, isn't it? Oh, wow. That confusion? I used the wrong, I used matrix notation. So. I think I'll use one of those. But the next one's A2 minus 3 C2, A3, CF, A4. Um, so, like, since we can't run the test with the second compression for the smaller one with the new stars, because we don't, we're not on EVs for the test, right. um, you're not wanting us to actually find an F stat, like the actual number. I could. So, let me finish. Oh, I could give you two regressions. And give you the, the, all the data you need to form the F. So when you run this regression, you'll get RSS restricted. When you run this regression, you'll get RSS unrestricted. <coughs> so I could get, put coefficients and T statistics and give you RSSs and Ns and all of that, and then, but I can't actually make you run it, the regressions themselves. So I have to give you the output. If you look at past exams, that's basically what I do. The, the form of the exam, I meant to say, will be just like last year in terms of the style and the form, not the question of identical, obviously. So if you were not, if you weren't to give us the RSS, that's what you're asking for when you ask to describe in detail how to test. Right, right, right. When I say describe in detail, you're, you're just going through this process for me. Do you want us to do it and describe what we're doing? Or describe each step, yeah, yeah. You don't have to do the spreadsheet thing. Just say transform the variables to get the new star variable or, or something like that. Okay. 
So now you can run, once you've made these new variables, either in the program or in your spreadsheet, wherever you make them, usually you would do this inside the program. You just calculate these as new variables. You've got those two pieces of data. Then F is equal to R, S, S. Which one's bigger, restricted or unrestricted? Restricted is always bigger because unrestricted can always choose to impose the restriction and, I, and duplicate what the other one does. So it can always do as well. This regression can always impose the restriction by itself. So it can always do at least as well. It can choose these coefficients that make this true. So it can do at least as well, it usually does better. So the restricted is always bigger, always has a bigger error. Minus the unrestricted over, what's this one over? Number of restrictions, which in this case is one. If you don't know, how do you tell? Start counting. <coughs> how many parameters in here? Beta one, beta three, two. How many in that one? Three, one restriction. You lost a parameter. Something's equal to something else, so it fell out. So you can always just count the parameters at the end to get the number of restrictions if you're not sure. Divided by RSS unrestricted divided by N minus K, where K in this case is 3. So to give you something specific, you probably should you know, not lose one point out of 20 by telling you that K is 3 in this case. And then the F has number of restrictions, N minus K degrees of freedom. So you compare F critical, which is that, to the calculated F. If F is greater than F critical, or F is less than F critical, what? When F is bigger than the critical value, you reject. When F is less than the critical value, you fail to reject. Kind of ran out of room there. I had to arrange so the music would start playing just after we finish each problem. It's kind of a transition thing to make you feel better. Clear enough or not? There could be more than one restriction and it can involve more than two variables. What might confuse you is if I have four and I made this two, added another variable, it's still just one restriction. Not the number of variables in, the restri in this thing. It's the number of equal signs, essentially. To use Jeremy's trick. What was our hypothesis? Okay, um, good question. <laughs> What's the hypothesis? I should have written that down. That's what we're testing. That 4 beta 2 minus 2 beta 3 equals 6 versus 4 beta 2 minus 2 beta 3 does not equal 6. And I should have said that somewhere, so thank you for asking. I should have said that somewhere along the way. That's what this is testing. So intuitively, we just impose the restriction. If it's true, it shouldn't matter. When I impose this restriction on this model and it's true, it shouldn't change the, the RSS very much. If it's false, it should go up a lot. So we're just looking at the truth of the restriction by how much the residual sum of squares changes.
Can you go over multiplicative corrections? This is a question about heteroscedasticity. I'm going to broaden it slightly. But, um, I'll answer your question directly at some point. So it wants to know about the multiplicative form of heteroscedasticity. The, the bigger issue here is that what we're doing with heteroscedasticity, if you remember that, we've got one variance for every time period. There's n observations, there's n variances. We have k parameters. So if we try to estimate all that stuff, there's n, obs there's n variances, k parameters. We have n plus k things to estimate. That's way too many because we only have n observations. It's, it's like trying to find, here's one piece of information. I can't get two answers. I can't get an x and y exactly out of this. <laughs> Because I'm trying to find two things, but I only have one piece of information. In general, you need as many pieces of information as the number of things you're trying to find. So if I'm trying to find n plus k things, and I only have n ops, it's not going to work. So somehow, I have to reduce the dimension of this problem. And the way we reduce the dimension of that problem is we parameterize the variance. We write down a model of the variance, that reduces it from estimating n things down to estimating p things, just the alphas, alpha 1 through alpha p. And as long as k plus p is less than n, then we're fine. And so we only use like alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. Now we've k plus 3 things. It might only be 6 things. Instead of if n's 100, you know, I have 103 things. Now I only have 6. That's a lot better. But in parameterizing, you're forcing the variance to follow a particular model. If that model is false, it's just like this. You don't want to impose false restrictions on your model. And so which model we use matters. So we have a variety of models, so we can pick the one that matches the problem we're trying to model, the type of heteroscedasticity we're trying to model. So we wrote down four main models of heteroscedasticity. One, so we have yi is beta 1 plus beta 2 x 2i plus beta k x ki plus ui. And the problem is that the variance of a ui is sigma squared i. There's an i there instead of being a constant like it's always been before, where i goes from 1 up to n. So that, that's the problem. And again, we can't estimate n of those and k of those with just n observations. So we wrote down four models. One is at sigma i squared. And I wrote this in two different ways. Sometimes I use sigma squared here, but I was worried you wouldn't realize it was just a parameter like the alphas. But I'm going to do it that way initially. You can write it as sigma squared times z i squared where this is some variable that's suspected of being related to the heteroscedasticity. This is usually going to be sales or income or some scale variable. This usually works when you have heteroscedasticity that, that expands with a scale variable, like when income goes up, the variance gets larger, when sales goes up, the variance gets larger, when wealth goes up, the variance gets larger, when GDP, you know, you're comparing huge countries to little tiny countries, the variance is going to be larger. So whenever scale is involved, this is usually the kind of heteroscedasticity that we'll model. Because this is the scale variable, sales or size of country or whatever, and, and, and this is the model we use. Now again, sometimes I just wrote this as alpha zi squared, so, so you wouldn't confuse it. To, this is just something to estimate. So now this is just a one parameter model. We can estimate all n variances by knowledge of a single parameter, sigma squared, or think of it alpha as you want. So now there's just k plus one things to estimate. Now the other models, and this is the one you want me to show you, and, and I will. Um, but just to complete this, then we also, I think we call them A, B, and C or something as we went through. We wrote down three more models of the variance. One was sigma i squared was alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z2i plus alpha p zpi. So that 
instead of one alpha or one sigma squared thick, there's p parameters for this one. It's a little more flexible. And in fact, well, not quite. I'll, I'll do that in a second. Sigma i, no squared this time, is alpha 1, is alpha 2, z2i, two plus alpha p, zpi. This one, the variance expands linearly. The variance goes up linearly. This is a linear equation. So when z goes up, this goes up by alpha 2, and it always goes up by alpha 2, no matter what the size of z is. So it just goes up linearly in the variables. So in this case, the variance expands linearly in the z's. In this case, if I square this, I square this whole side, it's quadratic in the z's. So the variance goes up a little faster than it did in the other case. And in fact, this is a special case of this. I didn't make that clear enough during class, but if you make alpha 1, 0, and all the other alpha is zero, you're just left with that. If I square both sides, I get this. I wrote them separate because it just seemed easier. But, but really, this is a special case of this model. Just make everything but alpha 2, 0, and then square both sides, and you'll get exactly that. It'll be alpha 2 squared instead of sigma squared, but it's the same many model. But it's okay to think of them as four models if you want. Then we wrote that the log of sigma i squared is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 z 2 i plus alpha p z i. So in each case, there's only p things to estimate, but they're, th they're four or three, depending on how you count them, different models of the variance. This one expands linear. This expands quadratic in the z's. This is exponential growth or exponential decay in the z's. So this can grow faster than this, and it also allows a decay process, too. Because, well, anyway, it's, it's, it's an exponential one. Now there's a reason I want to think about the best way to do this that makes the most sense to all of you. Just give me a second here. Okay. In general, the solution to heteroscedasticity is to divide by the variance. Or some constant times the variance. If you can divide by a constant times the variance, you'll get rid of the heteroscedasticity, and the variance will be that constant squared. Okay, now what the hell is he talking about? Okay, let me see if I can explain that. The problem is here. The problem is that the variance of the ui is sigma i squared. How do I get rid of that? <laughs> Notice that if I divide by any, any constant times sigma i squared, what's going to happen to this? It's going to become a 1 over that constant. So the solution to heteroscedasticity is always the same. You divide through by the standard error because the variance squares things. So what I need to do, once I know this, forget about this constant. That might be confusing you, but it doesn't matter if there's a constant here or not. That will come into play here in a second. Um, but um, if you just divide by sigma i, that's the same as taking the, what's the variance of ui over sigma i? That's 1 over sigma i squared times the variance of ui, which is equal to just what we want. So see that? 
So if I divide the errors by the standard deviation, because the variance is its expected value of u minus u bar squared, that square gets pulled out. And so when you pull the anything, remember that the variance of ax and a squared times the variance of x. It's always you just pull out the square. It's because of the definition, it's the expected value of the, of the deviation from the mean squared. So you get that square coming in. All right, so if I can somehow divide this ui by sigma i, that solves it. So the solution is always the same. What I want to do is divide this whole model by sigma i. And everything else we did was about getting an estimate of this sigma i. How do you get an estimate of sigma i? Up to a scale. Up to a scale. If we have an estimate of sigma i, and we generally got those by running these regressions and then isolating sigma i hat, but if we have an estimate of sigma i, dividing through by the variance fixes things for this reason. And it's also true that if I put a constant in front of here, it doesn't change a darn thing. All that happens is instead of this variance being 1, it'll be 1 over that constant squared. But it's still a constant. Now, in this case, we have, a, we have by assumption, an estimate of the variance up to a scalar. It's this. We, already, we don't have to estimate anything here. Because we already, we already have an estimate. If I divide through by zi, that's like dividing. All I have to do in this case is divide, divide through by zi, because I have an estimate of this up to, a, a, up to a multiplicative scale. This is the part that, that's. See, when we did this, in this case, we just divided by zi. In the other cases, we had to estimate these and divide by sigma i. But what I want you to see is we're really doing the same thing. We're really just dividing by some <laughs> constant times the standard deviation. But in this case, we already know what it is. Here's a constant. The standard deviation is just sigma zi. So if I divide by zi, I'm going to fix the problem. Because that gives me an estimate of the variance up to a scalar. So in the multiplicative case, what I can do is just divide through by zi. So you take yi over zi equals beta 1 times 1 over zi plus beta 2 times x2i over zi plus beta k x ki over zi plus ui over zi. That's the same as dividing through by this, essentially the same as dividing through by an estimate of the standard error. That is an estimate of it in this case, up to a scalar. And the, the claim is, this is our star variable. We have to form these new variables. We, don't, we run this without a constant. We make this new variable here. But once we make the star variables, x1 star, x2 star, xk star, u star, y star, what's the variance of this? What's the variance of ui over zi? Well, it's 1 over zi squared times the variance of ui, right? don't know that the variance of ax is a squared times the variance of x, this is going to be very, very hard for you. So you should have learned that in basic stat. That's the result I'm using here. 
What's the variance of ui? Sigma squared is the i squared, right? So this is 1 over z i squared. That's the term in front. The variance of ui is sigma squared z i squared. So this is sigma squared. As I said, if you divide through by something up to a constant, that constant shows up as variance. But this is not, this is just the, it's the same general technique. It's just that the estimate of sigma here is easy to get. You can just read it right off the equation. In the other three cases, it's a lot harder because you have to, you estimate this model, you get ui hat, you take ui hat and you run these regressions. You use ui hat as a proxy for this or a translation of it as a proxy for these. Then you run these regressions, get the alphas. From the alphas, you go back and get the sigma. Then you divide by sigma. But all the confusion about this procedure is getting the sigmas. Once you have the sigmas, it's easy. You just divide by them. And everything works. If I actually ran this regression, let me call this alpha. This is the case we just did. If I actually ran this regression, what will I get? I'll get, let me call it alpha squared just to make it simple. I get an estimate of alpha squared, right? So I ran this regression with no constant, I just went sigma i squared, ui hat squared, on z i squared. Or I could run sigma i on z i and I'll get alpha hat. I could then divide this model by alpha hat z i. And I'll get, um, I'll get a 1 here instead of a sigma squared. But the variance will still be a constant. So in this case, I, just, I don't have to do that part of it. It's just a simple case. I'm not sure if I'm making that clear or not. I hope so. Someone asked me what the coverage will be. If I did it in class, it's fair game. I try to list everything on the um, on the uh, review sheet, but I don't you know. Those are very general. There's one exception. The linear algebra was a huge mistake. <laughs> you won't be doing that. If you can, great, do it. No extra credit though. So don't bother. Okay, where are you still confused here? That help? My view is once you see the overall procedure, the details fall into place. But if you start really with the details, you get lost. And so I'm trying to fix the bigger ideas and then narrow it down to the more specific because I think that's the way to learn this stuff. So, you know, if you're still confused, let's, let's get it done. Say once more, why is um, bar um, error um, equal to um, sigma i squared? Why is that a problem? Okay, the, the, the question is intuitively, why is it a problem? Essentially, what you've done <coughs> is you've modeled, you've got, say your variance is 1, 4, 7, 9, 12, 18. So you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 observations. So this is, this is, sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared, up to sigma 6 squared. So those are your different observations. What OLS will do is it'll take you know, 39, 46, 51 divided by 6. OK, that's 8 and 2 thirds, or I don't know, I'm doing that fast. I hope that's right. And um, therefore, it'll use that as its estimate of the variance. It'll basically take the average. So it's never right. And so it uses the wrong variance at every point in time relative to the truth. Now, why is that a problem? Well, if you remember what heteroscedasticity looks like, say, just a simple form, looks like that. 
so that we can get this increasing spread. What OLS will do here is they'll say, th this is, this, where did it go with? The, the variance measure here is it's how, next chapter, spit it out, Mark. We're going to do something called weighted least squares. When you do least squares, there's a weighting that goes on, and the weights are constant at OLS, and the weight is really 1 over sigma squared. So it weights all the observations identically. That means it makes these as important as these. But these are much more precise than these. So you want to give these a lot more weight, and you want to give these a lot less weight. You don't want to pay much attention to this noisy stuff, and you want to really sit up at attention when that one shows up. And so what the heteroscedastic correction does is essentially gives more weight to these. That's what you're dividing through. That's really what you're doing. And you're giving less weight to these. And so OLS weights them all equally. It doesn't weight these enough, and it weights these too much. Because of that, it's less than efficient. It's not a bias problem. You get the right average. But you could have gotten closer on average by taking account of this pattern and using it to estimate. What class do you think that is? <laughs> Conometrics <Caught in> 1? <laughs> no? Film and media studies or something, and we're watching like a, a rap movie. Okay, so that's probably. Sounds fun now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're going to have to stop now. I know people who do all that stuff in their classes. We had one guy when I was in grad school would come out in a cloud of smoke. Two of one classes. I'm too nervous to do all that. I can't even tell jokes. What else? Well, for the person who sent me an email, didn't bother to show up and ask their question, I'm going to be a lot kinder than I ought to be and answer your question, since there are no more. Um, the question was, I don't get the stupid Durbin-Watson thing between 0 and 4. Is that on the test? <laughs> the word stupid wasn't in there. Basically, that was the question. Uh, if you show up yourself, you get to ask. Um, so let's, let's show that real quick. Why is the Durbin-Watson statistic between 0 and 4, and what does that mean? Why is it 2 when um, there's no problem? Why is it 4 when there's negative autocorrelation? Why is it 0 when there's perfect positive correlation? So, as my calculus teacher used to say, appeal to the definition. So let's go to the definition of the Durbin-Watson statistic and just work with that. So, the Durbin-Watson statistic is the sum from t equals 2 to t with the ut minus ut minus 1 squared over the sum from t equals 1 to t of the ut squared. And again, you know, when you build a house, you start from the foundation and you build a brick, you know, put all the bricks in place. What I find is your foundation has a lot of missing bricks. And um, that causes you all sorts of troubles when you try to do these problems. So there's two things you really need to understand before you can do this problem. What's the definition of a correlation? 
What's the definition of a covariance? And what's the definition of a variance? If you don't remember those facts, this is extraordinarily hard to understand. <coughs> what's the definition of the correlation of x and y? Remember what that is? It's something divided by something else. It's the covariance of x and y divided by square root of the variance of x times the variance of y. Remember that? So this is the covariance of x and y over essentially sigma x, sigma y. Make sense? You may have done it this way. Okay. The variance of X is the expected value of x minus the mean of x squared, right? And the covariance of x and y is the expected value of x minus ux times y minus uy. When errors are involved, <laughs> what's the mean of the errors? Zero? mean of the errors is zero. So for, a, for a, the variance of, if this is a, a uh, error from a regression model, this is just the expected value of u squared, u, u t squared. So if I were to take one over n times this, what's this an estimate of? How do you estimate the variance? This is the theoretical definition. There's also an estimate of the variance. So, so the variance of x is the expected value of x minus ux squared. But to estimate, what do you do? You take 1 over n minus 1 times the sum from t equals 1 to t of the xt minus x bar squared. And you lose 1 degree of freedom because you have to calculate x bar. And one, when you calculate x bar, one of the x's is, it becomes determinant. So you lose one observation. If I tell you the average of, of x and y is, is 7, and that x is 6, what's y? It's 8. So once I know the mean, one of the observations is no longer free. That's why you use n minus 1. You've lost a piece of information when you calculate the variance. One of the one of the observations is no longer giving you any new information. If I know x and the mean, then I know y. All right. Um, good. So if I take now with a large sample, it doesn't matter if if n is thirty-seven trillion. If I divide by n minus one or n. That's trivial. Doesn't matter. So asymptotically, it doesn't matter whether I divide by n minus 1 or n. So I'm going to use the asymptotic approach here. If I take 1 over n times this, what is this? That's an estimate of the variance of u. Okay, we'll come back to that. Let's just expand this out first. This is the sum from t equals 2 to t of the ut squared minus 2ut front room equals sum from t equals 2 to t slow down so that you write the ut squared minus 2ut ut minus 1 plus ut 
t minus 1 squared over the sum of the u t squared. This one goes from 1 to t. Now let me just take 1 over n times both. So we have 1 over n times the sum of the ut squareds minus 2 times 1 over n times the sum of the ut, ut minus 1, plus 1 over n times the sum of the ut minus 1 squared divided by 1 over n times the sum of the ut squared. All right, now we're, now we're making some progress. Think. What's this and this an estimate of? Sigma squared. What's this an estimate of? Sigma squared, it just has one less observation. It's not quite as precise as this one. It uses a different set of observations. Actually, it's the same number of observations. These go from 2 to t. This goes from 2 to t. What's the first observation here? U2. What's the last observation? Ut. What's the first observation here? U1. What's the last observation? Ut minus 1. So except for the endpoints, these are identical. We're appealing to large sample theory here. If n is again 37 trillion, dropping one from either n is not going to make much, it's not going to make any difference practically. And so with large n's, these are estimating exactly the same thing. And they're, they're equally precise, same number of n's, and it's just a slightly different number of observations, a uh, different set. One goes from 1 to t minus 1, one goes from 2 to t. But they're both estimates of sigma squared. What's this an estimate of? Well, that's going to be an estimate of the covariance. I didn't say it, but to estimate this one, it's 1 over n times the asymptotic estimate, x minus x bar times y minus y bar. So you estimate it that way. If the means are 0, it's just the sum of the xy's over n. That's what this is, the sum of the xy's over n. So this is 2 times the covariance here. This is 2 times the covariance. Covariance over the variances is going to be the correlation. That's where that other result is going to come in. So what we have here essentially is that this is equal to <coughs> Sigma squared, that's what that's an estimate of. Let n go to infinity. This goes to sigma squared. This goes to the covariance of ut and ut minus 1. And this goes to sigma squared. And as n goes to infinity, this goes to sigma squared. So we have 2 sigma squared minus 2 covariance of ut, ut minus 1 over sigma times sigma. I'm going to write it that way. And this is over sigma squared as well. So I just put those together and divide it by sigma squared and put that over that. But I wrote it as sigma times sigma. Why did I do that? That's the sigma x, that's sigma y. See the definition? These are the same thing, so these are the same. So, this is then equal to This is 2 minus 2. Well, what's this equal to right here? 
Well, that's the covariance of x and y over sigma x, sigma y. That's the correlation. So that's, we've been writing the correlation between u and u t minus 1 is that, as a row. So the Durbin-Watson statistic, there's a little bit of approximation going on in here. I sort of wave my hands and use ands instead of n minus ones and things in places. So there's a little bit of approximation in the background I haven't been very specific about. But essentially, this is equal to two times one minus rho. That's what we've shown. Rho equals one is perfect positive correlation. <coughs> rho equals minus one is perfect negative. Remember, we have ut is rho ut minus one plus et. When rho is one, they're perfectly positively correlated. One's equal to the other except for a random error. And when rho is zero, minus one, they're perfectly negatively correlated here. Okay, so when rho is zero, they're not correlated at all. So when rho is zero, what's this equal? The Durbin-Watson is two. When rho is one, the Durbin-Watson is zero. And when rho is minus 1, the Durbin-Watson is 4. I don't know if you can read that. Let me just write that again. So Durbin-Watson is approximately 2 times 1 minus rho. When rho equals 1, that's perfect positive. Durbin-Watson equals 0. When rho equals 0, Durbin-Watson equals 2. And rho equals minus 1, which is perfect negative, Durbin-Watson equals 4. I think that was on last year's test, if I remember right. The person could have answered their own question. Of will it be on it? Okay, where did I lose you on that one? So in general, the correlation of x and y is the covariance of x and y over sigma x, sigma y. This is what standardizes it between 0 and 1. Right, now let x equal ut and y equal ut minus 1. Then you get that the correlation of ut and ut minus 1 is the covariance of ut, ut minus 1, 
over sigma u times sigma u. But um, that, that's just sigma squared. Yeah. Okay. So when you get here, you have it. It's like a light went on. <laughs> Good. <laughs> like to see that. Um, in last year's test, you asked about a Canadian test and asked us to do the steps of it. Um, Which test? The Birch-Pagan test or whatever. For heteroscopasticity to write a correlation. Yes. Hey, hetero? Oh, well, uh, well, first it is asked you to give the step-by-step <coughs> step step, uh, description of how to do it. Uh, and I get kind of lost in step two of it. Okay. But are we doing the autocorrelation one or the heteroscopicity one? Uh, well, part B asks, what is the autoregressive condition heteroscopicity? <laughs> That's ARCH. Yeah. That was what I was going to cover today. You don't have that? We're, ARCH is not on this test. The answer is, you do, it's TR squared. <laughs> That's a model where the variance follows an autoregressive process. So you just estimate the autoregressive process and then look at TR squared. But we haven't covered that. So that you were confused is <laughs> expected. <laughs> Should I go on? Cochrane Arca? Last call. Durbin's hmm? age. Durbin's age. Let me use the same notation here. Okay, so the first thing we want to ask is why do you need to use Durbin's age? And then what is it? <laughs> I don't want to write down something different. Okay. The basic model we use this, except I use t's for time series. So that's the model. And in this case, you can use the Durbin-Watson statistic. Because the Durbin-Watson statistic, we've got over here, relies upon the fact that UT is an unbiased estimator. Because UT is unbiased, you get an unbiased estimate of the variance and the covariance, so the Durbin-Watson statistic is correct. So as long as you have an unbiased estimator of UT, the Durbin-Watson statistic is absolutely fine. It's when, for some reason, that UT is biased that we have to start thinking harder about the Durbin-Watson statistic. Now, one way that can happen is let's suppose that one of these variables is the lag level of output. This is the case where you need Durbin's H. Because now what's going to happen is that this will be correlated with this. Y t minus 1 has u t minus 1 added into it. When u t minus 1 moves, y t minus 1. When u t moves, y t moves. So they're correlated. That's what it means to be correlated. When u t minus 1 moves, 
y t minus 1 moves for the same reason, so they're correlated. Whenever one of your x's or one of the right-hand side variables, this is one of your x's now, it's called a predetermined variable. But whenever one of the right-hand side variables is correlated with ut, you have a problem. It's biased. You get a biased estimate of the coefficients, so you get a biased estimate of the error, so you get a biased estimate of the Durbin-Watson statistic, and that's not good. So we need another statistic that doesn't suffer from that bias. And that's what Durbin's H is for. It's a way of overcoming the bias when, the, when you have a lag-dependent variable, which is going to be correlated with this. UT has UT minus 1 in it. YT minus 1 has UT minus 1 in it, so they're, they're correlated. So what you use instead is H is rho hat times the square root of N T is what I should be using, over 1 minus T times sigma beta hat. And this is the beta on the y t minus 1 term. So this is beta k in my notation. But this is the standard, this is the estimated standard deviation that you get. When you look at your printout, it's just the, the thing that's the, the standard errors that you get for the coefficients. It's the thing you use to do the t statistic. It's the same thing you use to form the t statistic for this variable. It's just that standard error. So, and this is distributed normal 0, 1. So it's just, a, it's just like a t-test, just like a z-test, a standard normal 0, 1 test. Just absolutely a standard normal kind of test, normal, normal test. Now, if this is bigger than 1, and it certainly could be, then you've got, a tro you've got troubles. Because you get a negative number in here, it doesn't work. So this test doesn't always work. Um, like I said, sometimes that can be greater than 1. Um, if it is, then do the Bruce Pagan test instead. Do the LM test instead. I think I've been calling them LM tests. This row hat, you can get that right off the printout. Because you, you know the Durbin-Watson statistic over there? You can solve for row hat. Rho hat is 1 minus 1 half Durbin Watson. So the Durbin Watson's on your printout. You just take it. If it's 2, this will be 0. So you just take the Durbin Watson statistic, plug it in here, get rho, multiply that times this. And it's normal 0. I could ask for the definition of this. Probably I'd be most likely to ask about why you need to use it. And so the big point here is the notion that the Durbin-Watson statistic is biased when you have a lag-dependent variable and understanding why. Remember where that comes from? You can always, for OLS, you always know that beta hat is beta plus the sum of the xi minus x bar times the ui of the sum of the xi minus x bar squared. Now, if I just do what we did a few minutes ago, 1 over n, 1 over n. That's really the variance of x. This is, the, this is u minus u bar, but u bar is 0. So this is the covariance of x and u. Any regression coefficient is always the covariance over the variance. We, I don't know if you've, you've seen that. Some of the xi minus x bar, y minus y bar, that's covariance of x and y. Some of the xi minus x bar is variance of x. So it's always the covariance over the variance when you do a regression coefficient. But um, anyway. For the, that's a different point. So this thing, so this is the beta plus the covariance of x and u over the variance of x. So whenever x and u are, are correlated at all, 
whenever there's any covariance here, you won't get, when I take the expected value of this, I should have taken the expected value to, to get that result. But anyway, expected value of this is the expected value of that, which is that. Anyway, the point I want to make, though, is just this point over here. Whenever x and u are correlated, and this is every x in the model. This goes from 1 to t. So if ui is correlated with any of these things, this won't be 0. So you, you, you need the result that x and u are uncorrelated in order for this to be unbiased. Otherwise, beta hat will be the true value plus some, this is the bias. This is a measure of the bias. So whenever this is non-zero, you're going to get a biased estimate of the regression coefficient. And that's what's going on in here. Because this correlation between the x's, this is one of the x's, and the u's are non-zero, you get a bias estimate. If these beta hats are all, the way you get u hat is you take y minus beta 1 hat minus beta 2 hat x2 minus beta p k hat y t minus 1, if all these betas are biased, you're going to get a biased u hat. That'll bias the Durbin-Watson statistic and get the wrong answer. So you take this row hat and you sort of adjust it based on something. This is, this is adjusting for the bias, essentially. Medium <laughs> um, What are they like? Um, I don't know. I can't remember. Um, they're they're bilingual for the most part. So I get people who know it and they do well. I get people who don't know it and they don't do quite as well. And there there seems to be very few people that get half of it. Um, those are generally the ones that just didn't put the effort in to get to the one <laughs> get to the other end. And so, um, but no more people fail this class than any other one. Which, let me say something about the exam. I'm not going to be here, but I consider cheating stealing. The reason is, the way I do my grades is I simply start at the top of the distribution. When we're all done with the class, I'll take the spreadsheet and I'll grab all the final scores, the weighted scores, and I'll sort them from top to bottom. I'll go down a certain percentage and I'll draw an A line where I find a little gap and I'll find the next one, the next <coughs> one. And sometimes there aren't any gaps. And I, it's a very rigid procedure that I go through like that. And so it, it, it comes out and no more or less people are going to get A's, B's, or F's no matter where the mean is because it's always norm for the mean through that procedure. That way I don't have to worry about whether I have GTFs that take a lot of points off or a few points off because that moves the mean. And since I'm not the one grading them every year, I can't trust that year to year I get the same means. Because different people have different sort of standard things they take off. And as long as it's consistent across the class, I'm going to have one GTF grade an exam, one grade the final, so it is consistent, this procedure will fix it. But if someone cheats, what happens is they can very easily move across the line. When that happens, someone else necessarily gets knocked below it. That means you've stolen a grade from them. And so when I find people cheating, I don't treat them any differently than I treat a common thief. So I just want you to be aware of that. You're stealing grades from other people in this class, and I'm going to treat it that way if I find it, which means I'll do everything in my power to kick your ass out of here. Um, I won't be able to, probably, because <laughs> they're not as darn as hard as I am, but I'll, I'll do what I can. So um, just so you know that. It's mostly for the people who aren't here today. You're, you're, the, good, you're the good people. <laughs> but um, it's probably good I'm not here. I'm not a nice guy at test day. All right, no new material. I guess that's good. You all seem to want to go early. Okay. <laughs>